Good. Now we're in a series called Rings of Fire where we're talking about some fire stories from the Bible and I don't think anything is complete without your own fire story. Like I feel like even Beavis and Butthead had their own fire story. Like there was always something with fire going on, right? And so my own fire story, I've told this maybe like four times in my life. So maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't, that's fine. Um, I was in Algonquin, Illinois. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Illinois is a state way, you fly over it. You just fly over it. That's, so I was in Algonquin, Illinois. Uh, we didn't even have three kids yet. We had two daughters. Uh, Jody and I are hanging out in a townhome in Algonquin, Illinois, and I'm up doing bath time as good dads, good dads do. I'm in bath mode. Jody is downstairs. We've got the grill going. It is game on. We're having chicken. I mean, it's a good spring day. Let's go, right? Uh, so I'm just hanging out, and all of a sudden I hear that yell, that like, Mike! And I'm like, well, that's... That's like a panicked yell. It's like, you know, what's going on? So I walk down like all cool and frustrated. I'm like, what is going on now? You know, like, I mean, sorry, you do that. I'm such a good husband. I just walk down to be fully present and ready to serve. That's what I was doing. Um, <laughs> and so I walk down and all of a sudden, like there's this, the grill that's out on our back little patio thing. There are flames shooting out of the knobs of our like propane tank grill and chicken is smoldering in a the black heap of ash and like flames are shooting. I'm like, well, that's not normal. I'm like, what did Jody do now? Like what's, what's going on? And I, I can't, I mean, I'm not like the most adaptable human being that's ever been and I can't get the flames out, right? I don't know what to do. I don't know why I thought of this, but Jody's uncle is like a captain in the fire department. He's amazing, like fire person of the year type of guy. Like he's literally awesome. So I call him and I'm like, Dave, like there's flames shooting out of the knobs of the propane fire grill. And he's like, what idiot is calling me about this? So if you work with fire, I'm sorry, we're dumb. We don't know, we don't know. And he's like, you're gonna wanna put copious amounts of water on that? And I'm like, yeah, I, okay, so I'm like, Joe, copious amounts of water. And we're like dumping water on it, and it ain't working. And like the flame is spreading, and like it's going, it's melting things. I'm wigging a little bit. I call Dave back. I'm like, Dave, it's not working. He's like, how close is it to the house? And his voice changes, and anytime you hear a fireman's voice change, you're like, uh-oh, it's all over now. So we're, we're done. He's like, you're going to want to get that away from the house as quick as possible. And I'm like, Joe, take the girls, get to the front, take the van, drive as far away as you can, you know? And I'm like, all right, I muster like my inner Jack Bauer in the moment, like 24 was huge at the time. So I'm like, we're, I'm like mustering all that that I got. And I go and I go to the like move the like grill and the propane tank and I move it. And all of a sudden the propane tank comes loose oh, no. and the grill is here still melting. Um, and then there's a hose from the propane tank that has flames shooting out the end of it. I'm, again, I'm not a smart man. Uh, but I know, I know this isn't a good situation. So guys, this is my, I did what, I, I, it's the only thing I could thought of. I channeled my inner Olympic moment and I grabbed that propane tank and did the spin <laughs> and threw it into the common yard. And I was just like waiting. I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like waiting for like an explosion. I was like so excited about it. The thing, the thing hits and goes out, and I wait like 20 minutes before I even walk up to it. I'm like, so I'm sitting there, like that was my fire story. I basically saved the entire world. So thank you very much on my fire story. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I got. It's, that's roughly how it went. Um, you could probably ask Joe some more details. She'll tell you more. But like what we're talking about in the fire series, like it's going to be, a, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're talking about some moments where there's some moments in scripture that some fire is involved and then like what we can learn from that. So where we're going to go today, we're going to talk about the, the story of Elijah. He's the Old Testament prophet. We'll talk more about that. But there's some characters that I want to bring into the story. So we're going to talk about fire today and Elijah. Next week, we're going to talk about making beauty from ashes on Mother's Day. Fellas, if you don't know, it's Mother's Day in a week. Now you know. So, you, like, let's go. The clock is ticking. Let's get that. Uh, so, coals on the, on the next week, and then we'll talk about smoke and the fire furnace on the week after that. It's going to be a lot of fun we'll have together. But there's some characters we're going to bring into the story of Elijah. First of all, the main character is God and what he wants to do in our life and how he's moving in the story. And I've found, maybe you don't know this, but maybe the, the life is best worth living and by, life is best when we have God as the main character of our story. Instead of him, some supporting actor in what we're doing, 
Um, it's best if we're like, he's the star, he's the one, and my life is best under his authority and helping him and making him look great because he rescues and saves. And so then we've got also this best supporting male lead is Elijah, and he's this Old Testament prophet, or would it be this mouthpiece for the people of God? Uh, that's what some of the prophets were. They were men and women, and they were mouthpieces for the people of God. Muslims today still refer to him as one of the greatest prophets. Every time Jewish people set the Passover feast, they actually still set an extra place out for Elijah. He's a big deal. He's mentioned 29 times in the New Testament. And this guy doesn't die. I mean, we talk about it later. He doesn't die. He gets taken up to a chariot. I mean, Elijah's a dude, right? It's amazing. He, and so chapter 7, he's been isolated in pain and total dependence. And then he comes to this moment where we're going to hang out today where he has this mountaintop fire experience. So we've got God, we've got Elijah, and we've got this best evil king, a guy named Ahab. Not a lot of Ahabs being born today. Um, <laughs> He basically had done all the wrong things. He was trapped by his own selfish choices. He wouldn't listen to God. He was unwilling to do the right thing, and he married an evil woman. You're like, that's my biography right there. Uh, so don't say that out loud. You'll be in trouble. So you'll be in trouble. You'll be in trouble. And then we've got also, we've got Ahab, and then we've got the best, worst wife of all time. Um, and you're like, well, I know her. Just kidding. That's a, it's a joke. It's a joke. And you're like, it's Jezebel. And you're like, not a lot of Jezebels being born today. They're like, oh, she's so beautiful. Jezebel, Jezzy is so great. Not a lot of Jezebels being born today. She's not great. She's widely regarded as one of the most evil women of all time. If your name is Jezebel, there's hope for you. I didn't mean to make any fun. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, she led her husband. She led her country. She led her nation far away from God. And she had 850 prophets around her that would tell her that everything that she is doing was right and good. I mean, she was so powerful and so evil that she had killed everyone else and only got people around her to say what she was doing was fine. So it makes me think, even at the beginning of all this fire story, we've got to ask some questions like, who speaks truth to you? Or maybe even better said, who do I allow to speak truth to me? Because there's a way that we can live where we surround ourselves with only people that will do or will only say what we want to hear. And there's a way that we can live that will only surround ourselves with people that are in relationship with us because the benefit that it gets to be in relationship with us. So who is it that's willing to risk the relationship with us to speak the truth out of love? Who's willing to say like, ah, I know I'm not going to get invited to the family dinner anymore or vacation or anything like that, or we may not get to do all the stuff that we used to do because we were BFF and friends and all that stuff. We were in relationship with each other, but I am willing to speak the truth in love, not because I need anything from you, but because I am for you and I'm worried about the direction that you're going is going to end in ruin. Like, is there anyone in our world that we've allowed to speak the truth to us? Right. And is there anyone in our world that has ever taken the risk of the relationship to help us stop walking towards ruin? And if you don't have anyone like that, I'm just going to tell you, you need some people that will lay down in front of you and go like, hey, I am so for you. I have nothing in agenda on this, but you cannot keep walking this way. And I'm willing to risk our friendship on the fact that I won't let you walk this way towards ruin. Jezebel had none of that. She actually had 850 prophets that would say the complete opposite of that. But we have this one guy, Elijah, who's willing to step into the mess. So this is what kind of happens. The culture's spiraling out of control. Like there's, there's all this stuff. So Ahab and Jezebel have messed everything up. And there's this like one prophet of God that's like this remnant of people. And he's got to like go after and he's got to speak truth that God has appointed him to say. And it's game on in this story. It can be found in 1 Kings 18. Actually, all of 1 Kings is amazing. So it says this. So Obadiah, in fact, if you're pregnant right now, there's going to be some great names you want to write down for later. You may want this. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him that Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when Ahab saw, sees Elijah, he says to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? I'm like, they hadn't got real good at smack talk yet. So, I mean, it's like, oh, is that you, troubler of Israel? You know, it's like, okay. You know, it's like, but like a Western music is going down right now. It's like, you know, it's like, it's game on. Because it's like the king, the most powerful person of the most powerful nation, and this one person that's speaking up for God, and he's like, you're the one that's messing everything up. And he goes, 1 King 18 says, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. 
but you and your family have, and your father's family have. It's like your mom, basically, is what he's saying back to him. He hasn't got great at smack talk yet, but he's going to get there. You've abandoned the Lord's command and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. I'm, I'm, so I'm wired. I'm like competitive. I'm a little bit type A. You probably figured that out. And I'm like, if there's a game, I want to win it. Like it's, so for me, like I played basketball in high school and college. And so when we would go to another person's gym or an away gym, I like playing away way better than I like playing at home. Because away, it was like all of us silence this gym right now. Let's go. And I'm just wired to say there's a challenge. I want to meet it. Bring it. And that's what Elijah's doing in this moment. He's like, summon everybody, all of Israel. Let's go to Mount Carmel. Let's bring it. You bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And I'm like, that's a big table. I don't, I, I don't, I've never seen a, pro, a table of 400 that pe- people could sit at. That's a big table. I don't know how they made that back then, but anyway, that's how my mind reads scripture. I'm sorry, sorry. Just letting you in there. That's free. So Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled all the prophets on Mount Carmel. God wants our hearts and our focus, and, and Elijah's going, I want to bring that back to us. They'll have no other gods before me. That's the people we're called to be. And you've got 450 prophets of Baal, and you've got 400 prophets of Asherah completely taking us away from who God has called us to be. And I feel like I'm supposed to be the mouthpiece. I'm the prophet for bringing this nation back to God. So, we, like, most of us are like, well, Baal and Asherah, that's dumb. Why would they worship idols? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of, right? It was like, you know, who's fashioning wood, you know, idols these days? Or who's fashioning monuments that we would worship? And maybe you are fashioning things like that. But maybe what's more realistic in our world is I, the idols of, like, power. It's like, well, no, I don't, I mean, I don't worship power. It's just more important to me than God. I mean, I don't worship money. It's just like I trust it more than I do God. I mean, I don't worship self, but I'm the most important person in the universe. I mean, I don't worship pleasure, but if it doesn't make me happy, then I'm out. I mean, so like the idols of appearance or relationship or image or substance or any of that stuff that we lean to and we trust more than we trust God, that's what's going on. So false gods promise what only the real one true God can provide. And a lot of us, let's just be honest with each other, a lot of us have gone to, towards all kinds of other false gods hoping that it will provide what only God prov- can provide. And then we get mad at God because we went to this false God to get what only he could provide and then it ended up that that didn't provide it. And we're like, well, why did you let me do that? And that's what's going on right here. So how about, this is what Elijah says, how about me and your crew, your 850, Baal and Asherah, and my one true God and me, we step onto the stage of Mount Carmel and let's be about it. Let's see what happens. And so then we've got this Michael Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event. In this corner, weighing at 145 pounds, soaking wet in his tunic from the plains and caves of Gilead, the one, the only, the prophet Elijah. I'm no, I mean, you're nicer, you're nicer, because they wouldn't have cheered. No one was there. No one was there to cheer. Everyone boos Elijah. And in this corner, weighing in a collective 9,000 pounds, the prophets of Baal and Asherah, and everyone's going crazy over here. Let's get ready to rumble. That's what's going on in this fire story right here. And then, before it all goes down, Elijah steps up to the mic. He's like, I just got one thing I need to say, Michael Buffer. I just want to say this in verse 21. He says it to the whole nation right there. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. It's one of our questions that I want to leave us with today. How long will you waver? Because if God is who he says he is and wants to do all that he's promised to do, then it's worth everything that we got. But if he's not, stop playing the game. I mean, if God is not who he says he is, then go after it. Sell out to material possessions. Those are the most important things. If God is not real, then sell out to it. Steal from everyone, accumulate more, stop giving, climb the ladder at the expense of everyone else. If it's all about personal gain and material possessions, then sell out to it. But what if it's like about image? If it's about image, then some of you are behind. Get in the gym all day, bro. 
Like you got to tan it, tweak it, tat it, puff it, twist it, tuck it, lift it, curl it, color it. Ignore the fact that you're going to die and it's all going to sag someday. But if it's all about image, get it. Like go after it. If it's all about pleasure, then don't let marriage or commitment get in the way of what makes you happy and what you want. Why would you if there is no God? And it's all about pleasure. If addiction is that good, feed it. Go for it. If there is no God. But if there is a God, the one true God who rescues and saves, how long will you waver between two worlds? Between death and life between misery and happiness, between guilt and forgiveness, between apathy and faith, between sin and holiness, between addiction and freedom, between foolishness and wisdom, greed and generosity, isolation and community, anger and forgiveness, pleasure and purity, the man, being the man of God or some cheap imitation, getting all you can or giving all yourself, little G wannabes and the one true God. How long, Elijah says, thousands of years into this room will you waver between two opinions? Because if God is God, follow him. Amen. First Kings 18, 22, and said, Then Elijah said to them, I am the one of the only prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. I get two bulls for us. Let, let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call in the name of the Lord, of your God, and I will call in the name of my God and the God who answers by fire. He is God. Let's just, let's just put the terms out right now. Let's go for it. 1 Kings 18, 25, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare, prepare it first. You, there's so many of you. It's going to take a long time. So, like, you guys, I know what I'm doing. You all got a lot of opinions over there. Just you go first. Uh, Call in the name of the Lord your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. O Baal, they answered us. They shouted, but there was no response. And no one answered, and they danced around the altar that they had made. And whatever they tried, it wasn't working. At noon, Elijah's getting a little more bold in his trash talk here. And Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god, right? I mean, 450 plus 400 of Asherah, you all have been like not believing a lie that there's some God out there who doesn't rescue and save. You just got this position for power in the way that it can advance you in society. Surely he's a God, right? And he can answer you. Perhaps he's deep in thought. And I, I will get into the Hebrew. I don't always do this. That literally means he's in the bathroom. So, I, so don't hold that against me. That literally, maybe he's in the bathroom, Maybe, perhaps he's deep in thought. So maybe your guy doesn't spend time deep in thought in the bathroom, but maybe they were wondering about this. Or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awake, and you should probably yell louder because maybe he can't hear you. He's just got his snooze button on. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom until the blood flowed. Ever gotten that desperate? Where like the thing that you had put your hope in and you were doing all the things to serve it that you could possibly think to do, even to the point of self-harm because you thought it would be in service to that thing, doesn't answer you. It doesn't show up when you need it the most. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response, no one answered, and no one paid attention. And I want to be like, because no one is there. And I get laugh at them, but then I realize the things that I put my hope and identity in outside of Jesus, there's no one there that has the power to rescue and save. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which is in ruins. With stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, fill four large jars of water and pour it on the offering and on the wood and then do it again. And they did it again. So we got two rounds and he's like, do it a third time he ordered and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. And I love this because Baal would like been the god of like lightning and fire. And so he's just like, oh, we'll play on your terms, man. 
Like, we'll do it, and we're going to douse this thing in water. Not gasoline. We don't even have gasoline yet. We're going to douse it in water. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. This is an important prayer. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me, not for me. Catch this. Answer me so that these people would know you, Lord. They would know, O Lord, our God, and they are turning their hearts back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And you're like, that's amazing. Like, I'm like, if I could, like, I'm rewinding. You're like, oh, that's, that was fast. I'm like, if I was rewinding back in history, that's one of the moments I'd be like, dude, that would be so sick to be there. I'm like, just let me be on a tree or something. I don't want to, like, be on the, with the swords or anything. I don't want to see it. That would be amazing, right? And then there's some things I think would be helpful for us as we're thinking through the fire questions as we're getting this series started. In those fire moments right here, I've, you've heard some of them. I'm just going to want three questions that I want to reverberate with us as we're thinking through what God is teaching us through the fire story of Elijah, right? First and foremost, where have I let the wrong people have too much influence in my life? Because Ahab and Jezebel got to a spot where they had so much influence and in what God could have done through them and the position that they could have had to honor him with it, they surrounded themselves with everybody that was pointing them away from God. Where have I done that in my life? Where am I doing that in my life? Second, who tells me the truth? It's like, well, truth, I'm the man. I'm the boss. I'm the husband. I'm the dad. I'm like, I'm, I, I tell you. You don't tell me. But where is it in my world that I've allowed people that love me and love the future of me to tell me the, the truth in the present? Because I promise you, if you don't allow truth tellers, you will have no truth tellers. And you can get to a position in life where you are exactly where you designed yourself to be, and it could lead towards ruin, because all the truth tellers of your life you've kicked to the curb a long time ago. And everyone around you is with you because of the benefits that it provides being next to you versus willing to tell you the truth. Amen? Anyone? Amen. All right, third question. How long will I waver? If God is God, serve him. Make him the center. Make him the author and the perfecter of our life. If he's not, stop playing the game. How long will we waver? Let me pray. God, you are good, and you're great. I'm so grateful for your word. I'm grateful for how you move. I'm grateful for the way that you lead. I'm grateful for the way that you are powerful, and you show out, but you don't show off. You show out who you are so that people will come back towards you. God, we need that. God, would you convict us? The healthy kind that would be the kind of people, the men and women, that you've called us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.